Alexander Matkovic. He is a researcher uh, from Serbia and currently employed at the Institute of Economic Sciences in Belgrade. Um, he also runs a blog called Research and Alternatives, which I recommend you visit, and leads a small ecological uh, NGO called uh, Društvena Akcija. So I'm just going to leave you. Um, his title is um, Can Alienation Have Some Room in the Classroom? The Experience of Yugoslav Marxist Centers in the Political Schools from 1974 to 1991. So the floor is okay. yours, Alexander. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for actually inviting me here. I know that some of you even um, uh, got cold, you know, during the organization and still managed to come. So that's like uh, respectable. And um, yeah, I think the discussion so far were really, really good. And I hope to kind of give my own contribution to this. Uh, basically, the title says it all. I'm going to work on Yugoslavia. I'm going to talk a little bit about the political schools. And uh, basically, my aim is modest. I want to present archival material. Literally, that's it. You know, and just you know, if there's a statement, basically, it's that the people we usually uh, don't research, the communists, are much more complex than we usually think they are. And there are many different currents and strands that are, I hope, will, will be. Uh, surprising to you. So let's begin. Uh, before I tackle the topic, um, just one, one interesting thing. Uh, this is a Google engram uh, for alienation and capitalism, you know, which actually uh, looks at how much alienation has been um, present in books uh, in the English uh, speaking language. And if you, if you look at this graph, so basically, Alien, the golden years of alienation are 19, the 1970s, right? And so it turns out that you can actually see this in the political schools. Uh, but before I turn to the 1970s, I want to stress that Marxist education in Yugoslavia has a huge history that stretches all the way up to the 19th century. And, you know, somebody mentioned Kardel here, right? So people might not know him that much, but this is his first book, believe it or not. It's called uh, Traveling Through Time. It's a children's book. It's actually a book that was used in uh, Slovenia and uh, the elementary schools at some point. There's like uh, copies of that book all over Slovenia. And it's a very interesting book. Uh, it tells the tale of uh, one called Stefan, like a child who uh, sleeps in the middle of the heat during the day. And uh, so to this Stefan, in his dreams uh, appears uh, a guy who's, uh, who Cardell calls in the book Professor Omnipotent. So, like, uh, don't judge, it was the 1920s. Anyways, uh, the role of this book was to educate uh, kids in economic history, believe it or not, and it basically used this uh, interrelation between Stefan and this professor uh, to argue how uh, by going back through time and, uh, you know, this professor would show different, um, how do you say, uh, innovations in humanity from the airplane to the wheel and whatnot and to the space age. And basically um, it, deals, it deals with how uh, you could point out to children how they must, must be ready and how they should be, be prepared to take on the real leading role in a society and to utilize these technical innovations not as an, you know as a subject to be enslaved by them but somebody who is there to lead and uh, it is very interesting that the book uh, actually deals with disalienation so it deals with empowering um, the humankind so it goes the narrative uh, to lead technical progress so it has this progressivist sort of uh, take in the book and uh, why I'm beginning with this? Well, Kardel himself was actually a, a pedagogist. So he was actually dealing with this and before becoming a member of the Communist Party, he was actually supposed to work in a gymnasium as a pedagogist. So this was his contribution. And towards the end of his life, throughout his life, he actually dedicated quite a lot of time to advancing the Yugoslav system of education for Marxism. And it begins actually with his book. Uh, the second book I want to um, address, so it's this one. It's called The Introduction to Marxism. It's actually a high school book from the 1974, and it was written by uh, some by a professor called Ehad Jihic, who was basically 
um, following the new system of uh, Marxist education that was introduced in 1974. Uh, the idea behind it, and I'll return to this later, was to have a unified basis throughout the whole of Yugoslavia from where to start. And coincidentally, the book makes some uh, similar arguments to the ones advanced by Kardec before. And uh, very interesting for a high school book, uh, there's a chapter called On the Authentic Man. And uh, believe it or not, it begins actually with defining freedom. So how does a high school Marxist book define freedom? It defines freedom as self-determination. So I'm, I'm going to quote, uh, probably the only quotes I'm going to have so far. Uh, freedom is the possibility of realizing true universal human needs and the possibility of expressing and multiplying human qualities. So right in the beginning, you see something interesting. They're not talking about some authenticity. They're talking about multiplying human needs and multiplying human qualities. So uh, why is that? So we can actually see it from how uh, the rest of the chapter is structured. What you see here is actually my scheme. So I read a chapter and basically just you know outlined what it talks about and um, you know how it deals with alienation. So the book proceeds actually to uh, talk about civil society and basically as a, um, as a sphere where alienation occurs due to technical advancements, due to exploitations uh, from the workers. It actually uses and, and depicts it in a very, very rich language, basically. It talks about the different construction sites, different building processes. It literally goes into the detail that you would not uh, expect from one high school book uh, in Marxism. And basically, it uh, even quotes from, it quotes, uh, uh, the language is similar to what the Praxis School philosophers were using at the time. It, for example, it talks about uh, civil society giving concessions to the uh, instinctual, uh, to developing artificial needs. It talks in one chapter, that one specific uh, paragraph deals with fear and contingency, and basically talks about, uh, it has this uh, lonely picture of a man who lost his jobs, who's wandering down the street, uh, is uh, judged by other people, doesn't know where he's going, basically, and talks about uh, and this fear and contingency that he's facing, basically, literally talking about alienation in a psychological, but also as, on a social level, as a consequence, not only as, an, uh, as a subjective feeling, but as a consequence of the structure of civil society itself. So at that time, you see already some structural moments uh, emerging. And it concludes the chapter on um, the civil society with outlining how in capitalism there's a, an inherent process of human self-destruction, basically like a death drive. So it uses this like very unusual language for a book that somebody would uh, you know, uh, think is basically brainwashing by the party, but it's much more than that actually. And um, so if you know somebody would ask me where the brainwashing starts, um, so to speak, I don't believe, of course, that it's brainwashing. But like, um, if you want to see where the party moment actually gets like uh, starts, um, it's when it talks about this alienation. Of course, this alienation is in self-management. It does not introduce it by any means. It does says we have observed that self-management is a framework for freedom. Sounds a bit American too, right? So, uh, but it's very interesting on how concrete it is. It talks about uh, self-management as being a place and space for this alienation, because if you see, it began with self-determination, Selbstbestimmung, and you have on the other side self-management, so, so a realization of this Selbstbestimmung, and it does so in the workplace and in the commune, and once people are going into this process of alien this alienation and it's also interesting to know that it's a process it's not like a, you know one single event that occurs it's basically a process whereby you start uh, not uh, working within the conditions you are given within your workplace or within your commune in Yugoslavia but you strive to create new conditions and multiply your needs and thereby Disalienated yourselves um, from uh, previous artificial needs, so to speak, and also it just inserts this moment of developing the productive forces. 
Why does that? Well, because uh, the premise is that you cannot achieve this alienation without being a complete personality, at least so the high school textbook says. And basically, you achieve that uh, by disalienating yourself from your workplace, not identifying yourself with uh, your jobs, also being an active subject and active citizens of Yugoslavia. So too bad for other you know, countries, and basically by developing the productive forces and by becoming a complete personality from all of this. And that's how you realize, that's just like a phrase it, uh, with which it ends up, uh, the global project of self-management. So the idea was that it's not only inherent in Yugoslavia, I was just kidding, of course, but that uh, people, if they want really to uh, disalienate themselves and really to self-determine some sort of self-organization is necessary, which I, I think on a very logical level it is, you know. So, uh, but it's very interesting that they identified it with self-management, basically. So um, I took this because this was the only concrete and throughout um, and concrete and very thorough, how to say, argumentation that you can see in a textbook that was used uh, by uh, by uh, Yugoslav teachers. And it was used actually in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I was also using it. This is a point, point I would want to uh, for people to basically remember. There's not much uh, evidence, there's not much uh, documents, there's not much archives that do hold like this information. It was a very uh, complicated affair. Uh, this actually uh, is a process of five years of work in archives uh, that we have at least some sort of understanding how this Marxist education functioned. And uh, during the 1990s, a lot of that was uh, burned down, closed, uh, books were burned even in Slovenia and Croatia, banned from libraries, thrown out. So, you know, uh, even though numerous there were, there's like a problem actually with finding evidence. So uh, I chose to begin with this. And uh, just to tell you where we are in uh, this Marxist education scheme, I don't know if you can read all the small uh, like uh, cubicles. So it was quite a complex process. Basically, uh, if you want to divide how it functioned, uh, on the one hand, you had workers' education. So it was done by basically uh, using institutions of workers' um, universities, uh, something now called open universities, uh, using unions, even factory schools, uh, so meeting points and various other bodies. It was quite complex in itself. Uh, the student bodies also in, uh, encompass uh, the, uh, you know, from the regular system of education in high schools and stuff like that. And faculties, they also encompass youth political schools. And for workers, you had self-management schools. So to those two types of schools that the Marxist centers themselves organized. And what were the Marxist centers? Well, now we go to the green part of this, uh, the cubicles. Uh, basically, and they were, uh, they belonged to the party. They usually belonged to central committees, but they were not uh, only, uh, there was no, not the only types of Marxist centers we had. We also had provincial committees, which also had their own centers, but also universities, universities, Marxist centers, cities and municipalities. So on each level of uh, governance, you have like one Marxist centers and one Marxist center, and in Yugoslavia there were 900 political schools and 200 uh, Marxist centers, and in total by the end of the country, in 1991. So uh, this tells you how complex this was. And basically, um, they educated over 200,000 people a year. So it was like, uh, actually, it was a bigger system than the regular education system, also financially and also in terms of how many people went through it. And what we will be focusing on today is just this one small box. So this is just like uh, one small political school that I chosen uh, just to uh, as an example, and that's the one in Ljubljana. Uh, so before we uh, go to the school itself, why do I focus on the 1974? And this is where the Yugoslav history finally begins. So 1974 is actually a key year in Yugoslavia uh, for the people who are here and probably know this uh, quite well. Um, basically, it was the time of the so-called 10th Congress where Yugoslavia had a new constitution. It was a time where actually um, uh, decentralization was supposed to occur. Uh, they also um, introduced Marxist centers on a state level, which means there were some of them 
even before, but now it was actually uh, chosen that Marxist ideology needs to be reaffirmed. They did that because previously some people here mentioned the Praxis School, so there was like a great, great clash with the party between the party and the Praxis School. Um, well, I can go that in the discussion basically, um, and it's very interesting that uh, if you look at it. Uh, the Marxist centers themselves, they were tasked with countering liberal ideology, with countering deviations basically, but also they were much more than that. So this was just like a short introduction to the year 1974, and most importantly, that was the year where education for self-management was introduced on a state level. And so let's see how it looked like. Uh, so if you want to look at Ljubljana in particular, so Ljubljana had several Marxist centers. As I mentioned to you, there were like the city Marxist center, the university Marxist center. Um, they had uh, the Marxist center in the central committee. And basically the, there was um, a school actually did my PhD in, uh, the postgraduate school of Zrtsazu was itself a Marxist center. So, uh, and basically it had two you know, workers universities. And uh, so how did this school in Ljubljana look like? I'm, I'm talking actually about the main one in, um, in the, um, the Central Committee Center. So um, it consisted of three classes of 20 to 40 students, two in Ljubljana, one in Maribor. And basically, um, you can you know read yourself this, but uh, it had a representative. Uh, students didn't work actually while attending the school. They were housed in different like uh, students' uh, houses. Um, it lasted basically from September to June, and five days a week you would learn Marxism each morning. So you know, like a beautiful thing, to, uh, beautiful way to start the day. You know, so. Other times you would actually visit coal mines, you know, also a beautiful way to continue the day and, uh, you know, different factories. Uh, but you wouldn't actually, you know, you wouldn't be a student in the sense like, you know, a student like a 20 year old, you know. Uh, I mean, like logically you might, but you needed uh, three years of work experience and three years of party experience, you know. So you wouldn't be definite, you know, like a beginner, you know. You would have some sort of uh, experience to yourself, and basically, 54% of the students were below the age of uh, 27 in the 82 and 83 year. So basically, this is how in the 80s, the early 80s, when the crisis in Yugoslavia started, how this like uh, political education looked like, at least in Ljubljana. And when I'm talking about the crisis, I'm talking about the start of austerity. The IMF came, basically demanded centralization of the economy. That translated and um, basically into uh, nationalist uh, uh, tensions with Milosevic rising in Serbia and so on. And this actually got uh, reflected in the school's program, basically in Vojvodina, the region where I come from. Um, a lot of the questions regarding the autonomy of the region were either you know, put into the program by some political leaders or taken out of the program by other political leaders. Uh, we had actually economic stabilization, austerity being studied in the schools, all as to prepare the workers for the reality that was awaiting for them. And it's uh, the whole point of these schools, by the way, is that you know you cannot just take a worker and put him in a workplace, in a work council, and expect magic to happen. Obviously, uh, he or she needs to know economics, history, politics, uh, laws, so basically where the country is going and how to integrate that. And, base, and also, because this was a self-managed uh, system, the idea behind this is that you needed educated workers in order to run it. You cannot, uh, once you, for example, um, give surplus value back into the factories themselves, once you give back some of the produce, once you give back some of the um, uh, controlling powers to the factories, uh, it's not, um, how do you say, the subjective level of education starts to play an increasing role that it did not previously play in the division of labor within capitalist enterprises. So this was one of the uh, ways in which these self-management enterprises were uh, different from once in capitalism, and of course, uh, this also meant that regional development was completely, completely different. Some of the factories, for example, I think also Yugoslavia never uh, went, um, how do you say, never went over the Second World War, if you look at the regional influences and differences. Uh, of course, in Slovenia, you know, factories and in Kosovo, also like Marxist centers were completely different. While in Kosovo, you had um, problems with even like getting books at all. Here at some point, just to give you a short illustration, the Ljubljana Marxist centers, uh, center even uh, included its, its own sports radio. 
So that's the difference in development, you know, even on the level of Marxist education. And so uh, I'm going to skip some things and show you, this is a map of Vojvodina. This is like a province in Yugoslavia where I come from. It had 36 Marxist centers. And so basically, if you look at the red, uh, red parts of the map, those are industrial areas where they had Marxist centers is like, they had a building, they had infrastructure, they, they were financed by local municipalities. And so the regional development and industrial development then spilled over into the development of Marxism itself. So the uh, areas which are like uh, shaded a little bit uh, less red, um, basically shaded in pink, they hold central uh, centers which were affiliated to other cultural institutions, for example, because the municipalities didn't have money to pay for the buildings themselves and also that translated into not paying uh, you know people who lectured there that translated into less quality of education so Marxist education itself was kind of determined by the level of industrial development of different um, areas in Yugoslavia and so to come back to Ljubljana basically um, so the schools uh, had to rely on, as I mentioned, municipalities for students also. So it was the municipalities themselves which candidated, like which nominated the students for the school. And here you can see uh, different logos of different municipalities in Slovenia, which were answering the call from the school to actually uh, get them uh, candidates uh, to get educated. So these were like uh, some of the municipalities which answered like that call in the year uh, uh, 88. And, um, yeah. So now to come to the main question of alienation. So was alienation actually taught within the schools and how? Um, as I told you, the data is very limited and I do not actually deal with alienation as a topic. So this is like my own limitation, but it was taught in some schools. It was taught in the beginning actually with um, in the, um, uh, subjects called the basics of Marxist sociology and the basics of Marxist philosophy. And um, it's very interesting. I compared uh, several um, school programs for several years in 1960 and 1980s uh, in Kosovo and Ljubljana. And it turns out, uh, if you go back to what I said, that in 74 they had a unified basis. So basically alienation was dealt in two ways. Uh, one was after the questions of the state and in a sense that they talked about uh, like the psychological disalienation, uh, at least as a topic. And in, uh, uh, in another way, it was dealt with directly in a philosophical way, even uh, Božidar Bidebenjak was one of the uh, literature uh, for, the, for the alienation question. But I think that the schools themselves were um, more practically oriented. They were not concerned with, uh, you know, basically establishing philosophy of alienation, just uh, discussing this with the workers, do they feel bad or what? Of course, I mean, they didn't touch upon these topics, but they were more concerned with how um, alienation could be approached both within the realm of production and the realm of consumption. So, and this started, of course, with the production themselves. Um, the framework in which they did that is something called socialist commodity production. So the idea was that self-management once introduced was actually um, uh, clashing with capitalist forms of production. Obviously you cannot just, you know, say we, mean, you know, like uh, established the worker councils and thereby we are in communism. Of course not. Of course you're going to have uh, still exploitation. Of course you need to change the relations of production, but the way you do that is not by declaring simply that alienation is dead one, once we enter the factories, but by viewing self-management as a contradictory system, as a system is, that is evolving, and from the uh, alienation of labor itself, uh, that deduce, deduce other categories of alienation and then only go into consumption and the critique of consumerist society. So basically, and they were also interested in this, not as I said, as a theoretical construct, but as a historical uh, experience of the workers themselves. And why were they interested in this? Well, because if you want to confront exploitation, you literally need to uh, confront the uh, level of experience for the workers. Otherwise, they would lose attention. They would not never listen to you. I interviewed about uh, 30 professors and also like other people. And uh, the main line that I think I got from the interviews is that the Marxist education only worked once it was concrete, literally. In no other way was it working, the people would just simply lose attention or consider this as a state ideology. And within the programs, you also have this constant tension of being uh, 
uh, Marxism within the school being as a sort of a expression of state ideology, but also something that is actually relatable to the workers themselves. And you know, this of course introduced, uh, as they say, heated discussions. So uh, this is Ljubljana, and also uh, here from the cinema's questions 70 to 8 and 20 you have uh, the topics that they dealt with uh, in the, the other parts of the program called basis of Marxist philosophy. So here is probably the um, the area where they would probably even read uh, some Praxis school philosophers. So um, unfortunately, I didn't interview people who uh, went as students to this particular school, but this is all we got from the archives, basically. And if you look at uh, the literature list for the schools, so it even includes some common names, you know, okay, Tito, of course, but also there is, as I said, Božidar de Benjak. Uh, there are also, of course, the uh, aforementioned Kardel, uh, the guy called Kirn. Um, so some people might know him from some of his uh, nephews here. Um, so Andre Kirn worked at the Marxist Center and uh, he worked in the, the ecological department of the Marxist Center in Ljubljana, which was itself tasked with, um, uh, for example, drafting laws on ecological development. The, there was also a project called uh, Slovenia 2000, which was based on the Club of Rome report, where they basically, um, how do you say, they uh, developed uh, ecological and economic projection of the development in, in the terms of like, you, you know, what energy sources you use and stuff like that of Slovenia up until the year 2000. And uh, so this guy was writing uh, literature for the political school in Ljubljana. Also, you, he, you have Boris Meyer and, um, you know, people who also from beyond Slovenia will recognize Franz Mehring, for example, Voin Rus, so this is the literature that would probably have covered the topic of alienation. So, and as I want to always stress, this the idea was not just to discuss literature. The entire system was called the system of Marxist education and ideopolitical training. So the idea was to train you to enter political discussions, and the, also by political discussions, because the party itself was not a monolith. It was not a monolith of political occurrence. Discussions were constantly taking place, and these Marxist setters, while they belonging to the party, so they didn't have their own legal existence, they were actually tasked with following ideological currents within the party and answering them, providing different party members with arguments so that they could basically know which flaw to vote and uh, to discuss different questions. And uh, there's tons of research that they did on the topic. So um, basically, in the entire lecture, I'm going to talk about education, but you know, it's important to know that they also have a research function, which went far beyond uh, just simply reiterating party narratives. And so, uh, if we to go back to the students now, these are some of the seminar papers that the students would write after finishing the political school. For example, uh, the one on technological development in Yugoslavia and self-management, I've read it, and basically it does mention alienation as a consequence of technological development, very similar to what Kardel uh, and this like Yugoslav textbook were saying, but in a more concrete way, and it talks in detail about also the ecological problems of self-management and how it can basically uh, develop uh, by using, you know, um, it, it speaks about biotechnology, it doesn't go too much like into details, but you can see they were conscious of it, you know, and also uh, keep in mind these were like workers' um, papers, so some of these are people that for the first time get some sort of education, and if you want to look into how expand, to expand education on a planned level and on a mass level, well, of course, some compromises need to be done, but at least this was something that for some of the workers were like a step forward, and this, I think, also should be used as, uh, as a tool against uh, a lefty narrative, against, you know, this uh, presupposition that the workers, I don't know, dumb or whatever, and then, you know, we need to somehow lower the language or whatever. No, we need to invest in education. This was the entire point here. Uh, also, this is actually in Kosovo. It uh, kind of repeats what the uh, Slovenian case was saying and basically deals with alienation um, uh, from the perspective of uh, production and talks about something that I will mention now, uh, technocracy and bureaucracy, basically as alienated power centers that arise out of the system of production when, because self-management had this uh, layer of directors, 
if uh, this sort of uh, layer becomes autonomous, then of course uh, there was this discourse of technocracy and bureaucracy, which was also prevalent in Belgrade. So this was a Belgrade uh, postal school where you can, I'm, I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I've been talking too long. So because uh, these schools were also uh, postal schools in the sense if you cannot attend, uh, leave your working place, you can also like uh, send letters and receive them. And this is one of the, uh, uh, the one of the lectures that they would receive in mail. And it calls like uh, this particular one uh, says, we need to disempower the alienated uh, power structures and talks about uh, the bureaucratization within self-management. So you can see they were also critical of self-management, you know, and not only affirmative. And also, um, this is something that I found really interesting, really also similar to Belgrade. These are instructions uh, for teaching the 19 1986 program that I talked about in Ljubljana, and it also emphasized these alienated power centers. Literally, the language is the same, so you see that it's supposed to belong to the same system. And so I uh, just wanted to say, you know, uh, show some of this. This is the exam. So you also get some exam questions, you know, in the mail, you can fill them up. And in the next issue, you would get the results and you can compare them. So beautiful, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, I was constantly thinking during the, you know, uh, getting all of this together. Okay, some of this sounds stupid. Maybe this was like not uh, you know such a high level, but then uh, I stumbled something uh, maybe a bit of more interest to us, and it's uh, actually a research institute called uh, uh, the Institute for the Research of Theory and Practice of Self Management, Edward Cardell. So the guy with uh, whom I began, and this was uh, founded in the 1980 and uh, the year 1980, and it's very interesting. Um, uh, so it was at one point funded by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, believe it or not. So anyways, and um, the idea behind this also was it was um, one of the leaders, uh, one, at least one of the participants uh, at some point was Boris Meyer. He was the former president of the Marxist Center in Ljubljana and the director of Tsankarjeva Založba. So kudos to Tsankar. Anyways, uh, he was the one who organized uh, a discussion on how to research self-management. So now we left the political schools like in the past and we're focusing on research. And it's very interesting. So uh, the institute began by announcing a research project that we can encompass the, the totality of self-management. And it's quite interesting that one of the topics they dealt with was like a sort of a philosophy of self-management. Anyways, I'm going to first address Boris Meyer's essay. So he, begins by outlining uh, the need for a sort of ontology of the self-managed being, as, as he says it, paraphrasing Lukács, and uh, it needs to come from within the dialectical... Huh? What? Yeah, 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 I know, but he was against the praxis school a little bit, and so there was some tension, you know, so... Uh, oh, yeah, I'll return to this. So, um, basically, he says that this project of the ontology of the self-managed being needs to come from within a dialectical self-consciousness of self-managed society. So, this was a very, you know, humble, like, idea. And uh, conceive self-management as a global project, similar to, like, the textbook. And why does this need to be done? Well, because, as also uh, Kardel before him, Meyer was not uh, at all uh, uh, satisfied with how self-management was researched, and I think also neither should we be, because uh, it's parcelized. And um, part of the reason why it is so actually has to do with the uh, internal construction of self-management, because of its drive towards decentralization, actually is difficult to study. It's completely difficult. Once you go into the archive, uh, Vojvodina, Slovenia, Kosovo, they had completely different systems of Marxist education. I showed you the map of Vojvodina. It's for, it has 36 centers. Uh, Slovenia had only ones in Maribor, Koper, and uh, Ljubljana, and some other small places. It did not have a network like that Vojvodina had. Also, for example, the Vojvodinian question, um, it was consisted of the agricultural proletariat. So you needed to go to villages and educate basically people and the phases of production, for example, of agro-industrial complexes, you know, and how different interests within these factories, you know, produce the conflicting uh, situations and, you know, how to deal with them, how to lead different phases of production, where to invest. So it's a completely different uh, case from Slovenia, completely different from the case of Kosovo. 
And also, uh, it's very interesting that this, once you actually want to research some trends within self-management, it's hell, basically. So I think Meyer was onto something with maybe in these philosophical terms, but you do, you do really need to some sort of um, overarch or go beyond this parcelization of research. And so what questions does this answer? Uh, Meyer uh, talks about like, uh, what, so what would be something new if we would research self-management as a totality? So he talks about a new quality of life, which would be different from state socialist and capitalist consumerism. So uh, we need to study how life would change under self-management. Uh, we need to do that. We need to study forms of alienation within it, like inherent to self-management from the productive process, which has a basis in technology, to market relations and commodity production. And if you remember, I basically mentioned the socialist commodity production, which is contradictory. So it needs to be um, uh, studied un under those uh, under this framework. And basically, um, he talks about uh, he d distinguishes uh, conscious forms of consciousness that are uh, taken over from capitalism. For example, after 1945, what happens to the you know, class enemies and like Chetniks and Ustasha? Of course, some of them are still there. They do you know write stuff, of course, which needs to be answered. You know, and this would actually be the case even if all of us here would just like take over Slovenia or whatever. I'm not saying that, but anyways, like if you would, would do that, we would be confronted with these social forces and we need to address like these, as he calls this, belated consciousness, but also new forms of alienation between ourselves as well. And so this is, he says, where ecological and technological questions arise. And um, I'm going to shorten, uh, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So this is almost the end. Uh, he says that we need to study the multiplication of human needs under self-management. Why? Because as the level of development rises, so to do other needs. And he says that the pluralism of self-managed interest needs to be taken, uh, taken into account as arising from these new needs. So Kardel's idea was that uh, Yugoslavia would be consisting of uh, self-managed interests from different regions, as I uh, talked about. And he says that this, uh, Meyer says, that these uh, interests must rise of new needs. So if you want some sort of like uh, coherent structure between within the country, you do need to disalienate yourself in the sense that uh, you can imagine some factory workers wanting like to invest in new cars, etc. And you can imagine also another case where they choose a different form of investment. So. Uh, I think alienation here for Meyer meant something actually structural, and he ends up with calling for building another ethics that would uh, go beyond what's uh, visible in state capital in capitalism and state socialism. And for me, I think it was very interesting. He went on to um, say that we need to stop um, uh, stop shocking ourselves at different conflicts within socialist society because they're inherent in this society. And so basically we need to, uh, to sort of take um, an I approach to this, which would be, uh, which would link ethics to uh, social transformation in the field of production. And also there, because there are other conflicts which do need to be addressed. And basically, um, uh, talk about ethics as something as a different form of reacting to social conflicts that arise out of social transformation. And so what I got from Hill's, him basically is that he is, I think, talking about that we need to have like a chill out ethics, you know, basically chill out, which is building socialism sort of stance. And uh, this is interesting because this was not one single essay, but it was actually put into the program of the Institute for uh, the Theory and Practice of Self-Management, Edward Cardell. This is like the book, um, basically in its fourth uh, and final uh, research uh, 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 research aim, which is precisely to st study the desalination, the new forms of desalination that come from within the uh, from within the forms of uh, self-managed society. So this is where I'll end. And um, okay, I've talked too much. Anyways, thanks for the uh, yeah, attention. Thank you, Alexander, for this. Uh, Really interesting talk. I think there are a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, maybe, yes. <laughs> I thought that Gregor will be the first. Oh, yes. 
uh, it's already working, mm -hmm. but I don't worry. Um, we just needed some time. Uh, so thank you, Alexander. This was, uh, I felt alienated, <laughs> properly alienated <laughs> from my own hometown. I've never, okay. I mean, you know, I was born 79. So mm. after all of these events yeah. already happened and I lived, I was a child of the 80s and this was really not the picture of Ljubljana I, I ever know. had. So mm. this was properly alienating and very interesting. Um, I, I suppose, um, you know, I'll do the comment instead of a question. And the comment is very appreciative, I would say, in a weird sense, which is that I remember uh, when I was finishing my um, my PhD in, you know, a proper capitalist um, kind of quasi whatever um, country here in Ljubljana, uh, I was forced by the government to take a, an education course on how to sell knowledge, <laughs> basically. That, that's, I mean, basically, it's how it was called. And it was a truly disgusting experience. So because it's capitalism, I had to pay for this education. So it was this kid, I literally had to pay something like 500 euros, which seemed a lot of money to me at that point. Um, and there was this like 20 year old guy, uh, passionately you know, discussing about selling and, you know, that actually science, you know, it's about buying and selling ideas and mm. stuff like that. It was two days long. It was utterly pointless, useless drivel. <laughs> it was really disgusting. And I had to pay for it. And I wonder, you know, I wonder... I wonder if everyone has this same sort of experience in this kind of, or does ev does every political mm. system really require this kind of, um, you know, centers of education? Uh, mm, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we could collect some questions and then. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel rather conflicted <laughs> because. Uh, in a way, I agree with your uh, general position that there's not enough research done in, mm. well, more or less, <laughs> how I spent my life here. Uh, but then, you know, you, the whole system of these schools, uh, you can understand them only if you understand the development of the system itself, the self-management system. Yes. That is an incredibly baroque system, and it, it was changing from year to year. It was a kind of, I think it's in a way it's unique, mm -hmm. but it was so uh, complicated and uh, that really uh, there was never, the decision making was always somewhere else. I mean, to put it simply, mm -hmm. the decision making stayed firmly in the, uh, in the hands of the then uh, called Union of Communists or the Part of Communists. That was the... That was the whole approach. That's what, how it worked. And these kind of things, of course, they had uh, all kinds of uh, nice uh, aspects. First, uh, they, they did function as a kind of uh, uh, parallel schooling for people who didn't have the proper uh, uh, diplomas. And, they, and it was, uh, for them, it was really a possibility of uh, uh, advancing in wherever they were worked. And so it's, it's, it's but I, I don't, I really can't uh, in a few minutes explain mm. how the reality of this kind of development and how it went and why why in 74 and why 74 is the year where really it it went bad mm. you know you know after the crisis of uh, of uh, 71 and the nationalist liberals then they really the the ruling party accepted that something has to be changed and they decentralized it and decentralizing they really uh, in a way uh, created all this kind of a structure an immense structure of all, all kinds of things but i i must say in a in a um, somewhere in 76 i had five possible votes <laughs> you were you were supposed to vote uh, on your workplace you were supposed to work uh, to vote in your communities you were supposed to work in this, uh, to vote for mm -hmm. someone in a, in, a, in a kind of uh, quasi something governmental, and you know it it, it was really an, an effort to. Uh, and what happened that those who then kept the power went nationalistic, mm. and that's how it ended. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really I I I don't want to discourage you. Hof of course, we have to research that. No, no, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not then, a fangirl in the schools <laughs> like. Uh, no, a bit no maybe. so it's it's it's. Well, I'm no. I'm really getting. Uh, mm. 
it pressed. <laughs> so no, it's okay, I'll respond. Uh, Maybe one question more, huh? Mm. Just to check. But, uh, mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for your talk. I have a, a really short question mm -hmm. re regarding the two types of alienation mm -hmm. that you've mentioned in this school. So one seems to be um, alienation as expansion of freedom within mm -hmm. civil society, uh, the self-management you've talked about, and the other seems to be um, like a completely opposite uh, from it, deprivation of one's freedom within mm -hmm. alienated centers of power, as you've already mentioned. So I'm interested what's the connection between the two, the two. Is this relation of congruence, mm -hmm. though conflictual or not? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Maybe, I can, maybe we can end here and I can just like respond. So uh, basically, uh, I think I would like to respond to Nadezhda's question first because it's like the mo most encompassing. Um, yeah, I didn't talk about the problems, you know, that would be, um, be require another lecture basically. And uh, the main point of uh, contention I think is that, and also this is where I see if, you know, like uh, I read um, uh, a report from, you know, the discussions within the centers. Well, you know, frankly speaking, they were pissed off with the party, you know, like, uh, because the party kept changing like uh, the programs you know and uh, you know when uh, the crisis hit it was like too late to respond to any of the requests basically and um, at some point even um, I think uh, it limited their freedom basically and it's very interesting that uh, I read some of the final reports from the centers so um, oh yeah this is the uh, the area which I didn't you know like uh, get to uh, show you but uh, the end of these centers were like pretty bad actually like the political school in Kumrovets, which was like the main political school Yes, yes, yes. So basically, uh, uh, it was forced by the new Croatian nationalists to go into a forced bankruptcy, although it could pay for itself, basically. It was huge, like 2,000 uh, square meters. And um, afterwards, the Ministry of Internal Affairs like uh, used it as a training ground for the police force, you know. After, during the wars, it was also like a place where uh, refugees were housed. And... Uh, Basically, uh, recently, uh, several like Chinese uh, companies want to use it as a spa. So you know, like it has like this sort of a history. And um, yeah, some of these centers, once they ended up, you could see, you know, like I've also read some sort of very problematic like uh, news uh, articles where you have some sort of like uh, the guy who would lead a Marxist center in some village was found to be like selling bottles of wine, you know, to like the, you know, the students and stuff like that because he had some sort of, you know, as we call a schema or like a context, you know, and so... Uh, a lot of stuff went into this, but I think that it did like uh, arise out of some sort of emancipatory actually need. Uh, if you really do want to decentralize your state and actually go into self-management, uh, I think the, the historical uh, conditions between this system developed was also highly problematic, but I think you do need like workers' education, like period, you know, definitely you do need it. The way it was realized in Yugoslavia was actually between two crises, so uh, so we should remember that in 1974 was also like a beginning of uh, the crisis of energy, you know, that's one thing. And also we had Nixon taking the dollar out of the gold. We had a Falker shock later on that reverberated into uh, the Yugoslav debts increasing. And guess where austerity came in, you know, so where they chose to like... Uh, save money, Marxist education, obviously. So, you know, something that was not completely necessary for production. And unfortunately, I also had to explain this to the workers themselves. So, uh, but I think that with all the problems and with all of the, uh, you know, inherent instability of the system, we need to learn from it. I, you know, like, I think this is the bottom line, also to learn where uh, the Yugoslav system failed, definitely, you know. This is where we need to draw also some of the conclusion. And I think that uh, given this, you know, like all, all give and take, you know, I think at least like these archival things, that's why I mentioned that my, you know, like aim is humble, just like to present archival material. And then, you know, like we see what we do, you know, from there on, uh, basically. So that's regarding this. Um, regarding uh, Gregor's question, like, is it, like, are there other people who feel alienated? Yes, actually, and those are the people I interviewed. So even the professors, um, so for example, Savo Bogdanovic, he was the director of the Moshe Piade Workers University in Zagreb. The guy is now old, basically, but he told me uh, he dedicated entire, his entire life to workers' education, even before and afterwards. So he even now runs like some. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Before, uh, before this development, that was the old-fashioned kind of schooling uh, workers. His his work uh, was uh, different. Uh, no, the, this kind of uh, no, this took off else. twice. Mm. Seventy-four, and mm. then after it was dead again. They mm. they get a new new kind of. Uh, emphasis yeah 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 because the the centers took over some workers education from the workers universities but the thing is also this one in Zagreb in particular was actually the most successful for example it used to open up other workers and universities in Cairo and in Zambia for example so even it used to export this but he told me that he met some of his pupils you know like ex-workers who some of them are now like like CEOs basically of companies and he when he talks with them basically he told me that uh, you know they have a cool life they have like shit loads of money you know they do drugs and whatnot and they feel like shit so like uh, this is basically you know like yes they it's a different system you get some money and then you ended up feeling like shit alienated some would say you know <laughs> so yeah this is like the answer to that and to the last question basically the two types of alienation uh, this was just my sort of um, you know trying to like square things up because this is uh, in reality completely disparate like in different like archival material and uh, you know I was afraid also to say but they didn't exactly have one sort of overarching theory of alienation which we do put up in the schools, which makes my work as a researcher, of course, like uh, very difficult, you know, extremely even, but like, uh, I think that for some sort of answer to your questions, uh, I would have to interview like people who actually wrote uh, papers on alienation, which I also wanted to do, like, don't get me wrong. So I did my like uh, homework and this is um, Josip Broz did a uh, political school in Kumrovec, so I ran through like 2,500 uh, like students' uh, uh, papers, like and I didn't read them all, of course, but I took uh, nine papers which dealt with alienation, and you remember the graph in the beginning where alienation golden years are the 70s, but this is in the 70s, right, so it correlates, and basically, um, you know, in the beginning, if you see, they did like this alienation, this alienation thing, but they did focus more on labor, and the production side but towards the end if I mean it's just like none works but still like uh, they focused more on, on philosophy as Yugoslavia was uh, uh, in this integrative part you know I've uh, contacted the archival the state archives in Zagreb but they did not respond before this lecture so I had to skip it but you know here it is they did it like you know so like uh, in the future if I write some alt article on this like I can give you and you can read it so that's it okay maybe we can go more Hi, Alexandra. Uh, very simple question. Thank you for your interesting paper. Um, about the Marxist centers that begin the day by reading Marx, can you tell us what texts by Marx mm -hmm. they were reading? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. So um, basically, it, uh, it all depends on who you are and like where do you come from. So let's say you're um, like um, a male worker, like in age 20, this is actually the type of population they were targeting the most. Uh, why male? Because obviously like most of the production was male. And why 20? Because they need new workers who would, you know, after finishing education or like going to the party or whatnot. And uh, basically um, a lot of these courses had one very boring, boring, boring beginning. And that was actually the basics of Marxist philosophy, right? Right? And so, like, um, this is also the most problematic thing. Usually they read uh, the introduction to the uh, critique of political economy. Once it was published, of course, they read parts of Capital. But uh, that also, uh, they also read uh, the domestic renditions of those, like Tito and Cardell. And so this was, like, the very basics, you know, what you would read. But also, uh, within the philosophy courses, they would read the young Marx. And, you know, in Yugoslavia, there was, like, this huge debate when yeah, the young Marx was translated. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, they did include this in the program. You know, so you, they would read the Judenfrage and, like, the Jewish question, like, stuff on that. But um, regarding how they would read it, it's a completely different, you know, story. Yeah, because obviously you need to tailor this into different, like, sections of the working class and somehow prove that this is of complete and direct interest to, you know for them to read basically which proved to be like very like um, you know they will the least i think they were the least interested on i mean like different levels in different schools they were the least interested in this like abstract uh, philosophical theories so you know they would be mostly interested uh, actually in economic history and uh that's one of the things I didn't get to mention, but I think one of the problems with this system was also conceptual. So because of this idea of self-management being a contradictory you know, process,
process and like you know socialist commodity production you know implying this this some sort of thing as a political economy of socialism which we can debate whether that's true or not uh, they actually didn't do that much capitalism which were interesting for Marxist political schools you know you had some economic programs within the schools uh, usually they did do something like contemporary history of capitalist countries and stuff like that and uh, yeah one center I didn't mention is uh, something called the Center for Social Research in Belgrade which actually uh, it was like a sort of a main Marxist centers that oversaw this uh, the like a decentralized network. It also was uh, writing up uh, the Yugoslav Constitution of 1974 and helped open up the Tito, uh, Josip Tito political school. Uh, it also dealt with research and, uh, for example, there's a book, uh, also it was used in uh, Zagreb, uh, the Zagreb political schools, the death of neoliberalism is a threat to the uh, socialist self-management and like the socialist constitution. So they did do, for example, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, you know, as a threat to socialism. And that was uh, once published also part for the uh, Central Committee in Zagreb, uh, its political schools, you know, where Stipe Schuver, some would know him as leading Yugoslav theorist, was actually present. And I think also the uh, content of these programs also depended quite a lot like who is teaching them you know who's the teacher right because that's where you have the physical contact between you know some like a living person and another living person so you can write the best program ever if you don't have somebody to deliver it you know people are not gonna listen yeah um okay hi uh well first i just wanted to say thank you so much i mean it's really refreshing to have this kind of just like information presented mm -hmm. um, so. uh, it's really really useful and really rare you know to, to hear that kind of talk and, and of course it's a lot of archival labor and that can be a lot of sort of you know drudge work but it's like incredibly productive it is, it so, so actually I just I guess I just wanted to ask like is it is it uh, part of your project is it possible to translate any of this material because even like the Cordelli mm -hmm. book on like the theory of self-management or you know um, it could just even if it's disseminated primarily in PDF form would be so useful mm -hmm. to actually get some of this concrete archival information in a sort of dossier form mm -hmm. along maybe with some theoretical content for how people were mm -hmm. thinking about this. Is that part of the project or? Yeah, well, I can give you my PayPal account and, you know, like, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, I'm not joking. I actually, like, opened up because, like, uh, I don't think if this was, like, completely normal out of me, but I've been financing this for five years alone and because I didn't want it to be a part of a project, but it is a project, you know, and the thing is, like, uh, one of the ideas is to kind of digitize, you know, some of this stuff. And um, it's not only about just like taking cartilage books, you know, and putting up in the PDF, like, uh, which I think, I mean, I can send you some. And I think it's necessary because, you know, part of the reason why this uh, didn't do, you know, like, didn't have any influence in the like uh, English speaking language and also even like into the domestic languages is that A, it's not translated. B, as I, you know, like uh, mentioned in the beginning, the archives were either thrown away, you know, even the contemporary left, you know, like, I don't know, Stretchko Horvat, some uh, people in Zagreb, like, different initiatives, like, uh, part of them actually went to the Josip Broz Tito uh, political schools, by the way, here it is, just, like, to, to see it, how it physically looks like, um, how it looks like actually now, so uh, people went here, you know, to save the books, and basically because, uh, you know, nobody cared to, like, even bring them to the archive. So, you know, even before going into the archive, there's this problem of bringing it in the archive, which was even some, in some cases not done. And so, like, uh, yeah, that's, like, part of the reason why it was not there. And um, I think, one, we would need to translate the books. Two, we would also need to translate uh, the reports, be, you know, between two people speaking, four, six, ten people speaking, and that's like uh, where I got actually hooked up on this project uh, because once you see how they are thinking of, you know, how to bring this to the workers, different sections of the working class, to the youth, you know, like to party people, it's completely different forms of population, you know, like uh, somebody who's 60 doesn't want the same things as someone who's 16, right? So, I mean, Novi Sad, like the Marxist Center is where, you know, in the town where I was born in, it was even published like books on emotional intelligence, you know, because the idea was that if you need, if you want to have Marxist education, well, goddamn, you have to be emotionally intelligent to have it, you know, because it's not about abstractions, but relating it to people, you know, and like this is the entire idea behind the system, you know, not to like, uh, you know, people will easily, I think, uh, go into abstractions, you know, like uh, when they enter faculty and do Marxism, you know, but uh, 
the thing is if, you know if you want to like bring the theory to the masses and make it empowering or whatever you know you need to do it in a completely different way you know and that like that's a constant lesson you know i learned from all of these things and i think you know if, pe if other people want to learn it again goddamn we need to you know translate also the reports you know in other books so yeah but the short answer is yes yeah <laughs> so yeah thank you alexander this is all the time that we have okay. sadly really sadly we can continue uh, the pubs, so. Yes. Uh, so, thank you. Again.